Hello everyone once again, welcome to term two and your introduction to the Victorian period. She's hefty. A lot's going on. We will have two introduction videos for this period. The first one will revolve around the Victorian period as social and political context, as a historical time period, and the second intro video will really zero in on literature of the time period, how literary artists were responding to the issues of their time. So, the 19th century encompassed one of the most significant events in Western history, even by today's standards. That is the Industrial Revolution. Most scholars date the Industrial Revolution from about the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, let's say the 1840s. This was a period of huge scientific advances across many fields, engineering and, and things like that especially, but also medicine and chemistry and, and a bunch of other areas. During this time, railways across Europe and, and even in the United States were expanding rapidly, um, meaning that traveling very quickly across huge distances was suddenly possible. When you travel by horsepower, you know, by carriage, you have to switch carriages when the horses get tired, right? You need fresh horses in order to keep going. A train doesn't ever get tired as long as you keep feeding it coal. That, that image in itself almost sums up kind of a lot of what was going on, a lot of the energy behind the Victorian period in, in terms of social development and, and progress on, on an from an economic standpoint. At the turn of the 19th century, the very first mechanized process for producing paper was also established. And of course, more pulp and paper mills were built to supply the new demand. Um, other key inventions include photography, which began seriously in the 1820s and then advanced throughout the 19th century. Charles Darwin, the father of, of evolution, he published his groundbreaking theory uh, in his book, The Origin of Species, published in 1859. Rocked people. Rocked them really that that's a good example of a text that plays into the mindset of the victorian period which is negotiating between old and new really renovating concepts of how the world works scientifically um by the 1870s the telegraph and the telephone had both been invented so pair that with the the newly expanded railway system for the very first time, humanity is capable not only of rapid and distant travel, but instantaneous communication over vast distances. Think about that. Photography, railways, the telephone. It's like society has begun quite seriously to overstep the barriers of space and time. These were earth-shattering changes. They altered people's whole worldview, as I said. Not unlike the way the digital revolution or the space age altered our parents' worldviews and, and continues to define ours. And in Great Britain, at least, one single monarch was ruling over the whole show. Queen Victoria. Victoria was ruler of the British Empire from 1819 to 1901. That is a long time, especially as British monarchs go. That is a long time. By the 1870s, just halfway through her reign, the British Empire formally encompassed England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, India, Australia, and much of North America. That's, that's officially on the record. Informally, it also had economic control over significant territories in China and the South Pacific. It was a global empire of trade and commerce and political and cultural influence. Um, Britain also had the most powerful navy in the world at that time, and at this time, naval power was the definition of military might. Um, advanced shipping and railway systems, along with this virtually global colonial empire, meant that British citizens of means, anyway, could purchase specialty goods 
and exotic luxuries from all over the world on the regular and consider it normal. I mean, we understand that because that's our condition now, but it w this was the first point in history where something like globalization started to be the reality for people, at least in Britain. It was beginning to be true already during the Regency, but by the Victorian period, that kind of access to the world's riches and cultures and influences is established fact. In many ways, Britain was to global affairs during the Victorian period what the United States is to global affairs today. They were the linchpin of stability, the picture of a progressive nation, at least on the face of things, and on the backside, also the driving perpetrators of some of the greatest systemic evils of the time. And that did not, that did not slip past artists of the time. You know, the, the sort of great beast, the, the Leviathan that was Great Britain, um, was frequently commented on and questioned and portrayed um, by literary artists of the Victorian period. The 19th century novel is a thing, you know, the, the great social commentary novel or State of England novel um, really evolves during this time, but we'll get to that a little bit more later. So that's the large scale picture of things that Victorian literary artists were steeped in and reacting to during their time. But the smaller scale picture of things, you know, if you focus on how life is at home in England, it was something like this. The Industrial Revolution leads to mass urbanization in Britain, meaning a large-scale migration of people leaving the countryside for what they hoped would be greater opportunities and social security in the city, you know, with all this progress and development going on. Um, this was a massive change, massive demographic shift that happened very quickly and radically transformed England's major cities. London, Manchester, all of these centers suddenly pff, exploded. Um, and this is happening all over Europe. That's, that's worth knowing. To put things in perspective, the German philosopher Karl Marx, as in Marxism, he was on the scene by the mid-1800s with his essays on alienated labor, which became highly influential in England as elsewhere. So in England, urbanization has caused a major shift away from traditional craftsmanship and, and rural lifeways and modes of production towards mechanized mass production of consumer goods. Labor laws, of course, have not even begun to catch up. They don't even know they're behind. They, they haven't been notified yet. Um, handmade goods are now being produced in sweatshop conditions in the cities. Life in these rapidly multiplying factories, mills, whether it's pulp and paper mills or textile mills, um, and in the expanding resource extraction center for, you know, the, the fuel that drives the machine, things like coal, conditions were likewise atrocious, especially for women and children. Child labor was commonplace during the Victorian era. Um... It was common, it was normal, it was extensive, but that's not to say that it was approved or accepted by, you know, the, the general populace. Increasingly, child labor and, and labor conditions as a whole became a subject of vicious public critique, especially in novels. Uh, Charles Dickens, as I'll, I'll mention later on, he's, he's your man as a social critic in, uh, in the realm of the Victorian literary period. So urban crowding is a huge problem, as was urban poverty. Slums developed as the cities boomed, and some of those slums became downright infamous, real sort of centers of social critique. The rise in mechanized production and coal power means tremendous pollution. Um, like, these are, these are dirty cities. Things are icky. Um, the environment is definitely feeling the impact of the Industrial Revolution. Matter of fact, today... When we talk about climate change, the Industrial Revolution is a big part of what triggered the escalating um, use of fossil fuels, basically. The Industrial Revolution was coal-fired. 
coal gave way in the early modern period to petrol, to petroleum, and here we are. All of this during the Victorian period, when it's still new, draws rising critical attention to the problems of class disparity, public health, public education, justice, social welfare. One of the period's most consistent and aggressive social critics, as I mentioned, outspoken on all of these topics that I've described, was our upcoming novelist, Charles Dickens, whom we'll hear more about in a couple of weeks. But there is he he's a big figure. Um... Also, in our third week on this period, May 23rd, uh, I've included a supplemental article on our syllabus that talks about a really wild Victorian-era um, phenomenon called slumming, uh, which was a particular kind of poverty tourism that um, became prominent in Victorian England. It is, a, it is a real engrossing read if you decide to take a look at that. Along with all the changes that I've described so far came major advances in printing, as I described at the beginning of this video, and consequently in the publishing industry. A more centralized population, together with the efforts of contemporary social justice activists, had led to improved literacy rates for men, women, children, across the board, in some cases almost notwithstanding of, of class even in the working classes, literacy rates were way up um, by the beginning of the Victorian period. Uh, Great Britain in general, but especially England, had never had so many readers of all ages than it had by the arrival of the Victorian era, and that number only increased throughout Victoria's reign. This general rise in literacy rates meant lucrative new markets were opening up for books and poetry publications of all kinds. You had children readers, women readers, educated farmers who are studying the sciences, you know, behind their work, because this is the age of the scientific method and of, of you know, expanding your production capacity. All of this created a groundswell in demand for literature, that incre and that increased demand coincided with some key advances in technology that turned the publishing industry into a booming business, chock full of product, highly competitive, very, very profitable. I've mentioned already that by the Victorian period, we have mass production of paper. I said that right at the beginning, meaning cheaper paper than ever before. And not all paper is cheap, but it, it can be made more cheaply than before. The other important invention for our purposes was the rotary printing press which came into use in the early 1850s. Previous uh, versions of the printing press, the movable type press, kind of meant you, you assemble your text and then the press, boom, goes down on the page, you slide out the page, you put in another page, boom, and that's how you produce your, your broadsheets or your book pages or, or whatever. The rotary press is uh, a descending, basically, print set that goes down on like a, like a conveyor belt of paper so that these pages are fed mechanically into this press that's going up and down. And if, if you picture the contemporary image of, of what a press looks like, just going, tuk, 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 this is the first version of that. The rotary printing press allowed for faster printing at higher volumes than previous models of the press had by a landslide, and this again radically altered the conditions of production behind popular Victorian literature. And the best example of, I can give you of how this transformed Victorian reading culture is to tell you about novel serialization. By the Victorian period, novels had become the dominant form of prose fiction. Those of you that read Northanger Abbey for our final week in the Romantic period, um, Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen reflects some of the doubts and controversy that proliferated around the novel as a form back when it was still newish, you know, in the Victorian period and into the Regency. But by the Victorian period, this was a bygone debate for the most part. The novel had become a highly sophisticated and increasingly a much respected form of literary craftsmanship, thanks to the innovations that artists 
like Jane Austen, had made through this form. Novels had never been more socially or even politically influential than they were by the Victorian era. Also, they had never been longer. Seriously, like those of you that are, are have been working on Jane Eyre leading up to this period, if you think Jane Eyre is long, you should see some of Dickens' fat boys. Like this, this is David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Tis large. And he doesn't even compare to the Russians, the, the Russian social novelists that were churning out incredible work during the 19th century, like Leo Tolstoy, my friend here, War and Peace. This is not large print, you guys. This is small print on very thin pages. She's hefty. That was the state of novel production at the time. Um, getting back to the Rotary Press, though, new novels up to this point, think about the 1850s, had generally been published in bound volumes. Really pretty, hardcover, cloth-bound volumes, like this guy. Uh, this is Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. Uh, and they could be really expensive to buy if you were a middle or lower class reader or a child reader, a young reader. Uh, these were high production value books. Consequently, this new mode of publication called serialization rose to prominence. And basically what this means is that instead of a novel being written and coming out all at once in a bound volume, novelists were publishing their works chapter by chapter fragment by fragment, in journals or, or magazines, periodicals they're called, that people would purchase regularly, weekly or bi-weekly, for a very affordable price, you know. Um, I don't know what a, a weekly journal would have cost in, in Victorian terms, but like it was change, you know, it's the kind of thing you can afford to do regularly. So serialization, this is like the print culture ancestor of streaming, for us, you know, Netflix and, and Crave, subscription-based, serialized production for a mass audience at an affordable price. And this worked brilliantly for short fiction, whether it was individual stories or, or long-running popular series like Sir Arthur Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes mysteries. They were uh, a really popular series at the time. But serialization worked even better, economically speaking, financially speaking, for novels. And here's why. Once a novel was complete and the last serial episode finished its print run in, in the magazines, that novel, if it had been a successful book, would then get a second life turned into a bound volume and sold to those who wanted a complete bound copy of their own to, to reread and, and to have. If a book was really popular, of course, just like today, the bound volume might go through several printings or even several editions. So the novelist who decides to publish serially publishes at least twice and gets the money for both, and, and oftentimes more often. Charles Dickens' novel Great Expectations, which some of you will be reading in a couple of weeks, for example, was originally serialized in a magazine called All the Year Round, uh, in which it ran from December 1860 to August 1861. The first bound edition appeared after, you know, the serial closed, and it went through five separate editions before the year was out. The serial ends August 1861. Let's say the bound volume comes out almost immediately, September 1861. September, October, November, December. Five printings inside of four months. Dickens was that popular at the time, I'm telling you guys. He was bigger than the Beatles. Consummate rock star, screaming crowds waiting for him on the docks of the United States when he came to visit. And the book has never been out of print since. For 150 years, people have bought this book. This is what serialization is all about and, and sort of tells you a little bit about the the, the jostling, jam-packed quality, the competitive nature of the publishing industry and, and, and reading culture during the Victorian period. It was a lot like the sort of packed quality of media culture right now, where we've got streaming platforms that are just full of content, and you've got podcasts and, and all the rest of it. That's all digital. In the Victorian era, it was all print. 
but it was loud and it was big and it was lucrative. That's a little bit about the Victorian period as a sort of, you know, socioeconomic and historical context, some of the contextual factors that were influencing literature at the time. Click on over to part two of this introduction for a more focused look on literary forms, norms, and themes at the time, including an overview of specific readings on our course for this period.